make sure I'm on here. Am I good? Okay. All right, so I need to pray for the offering, right? Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your faithfulness. It is so, so great, Lord. We thank you for the many blessings you bestow upon us, Lord. We thank you for our first fruits that we're about to give to you. May it be used to expand your kingdom here and abroad. And I pray that uh, you be with us this morning as we dive into this text and, and peel something out to apply in our lives, Lord. May you be glorified in your name. Amen. So as we've been progressing through the book of Proverbs, today we're in chapter 26. And if you remember from last week, PJ was talking about how chapter 25 started the, proverb, or the, the Solomon Proverbs that were recorded or copied by the men of Hezekiah. And 26 is just a continuation of those recordings. Now, I want to um, start off with a little congregational involvement. And you all are probably like, a pop quiz already? <laughs> now, I want you to think back to your childhood, okay? Maybe for some of you that's a little harder to do, but for, for most of us, we might be able to think back to our childhood. I want you to think back to some of those warnings that you might have received, those repeated warnings. For example, don't touch that, it's hot. And maybe you were, you were told that you're going to burn yourself. But what are some other warnings, repeated warnings that you received as a child? Feel free to just share them out. Don't do that. Look both ways. Don't talk to strangers. Don't play with matches. Don't play with matches. What was the other one? Don't eat too much sugar. Keep the doors locked. Turn off the lights. Close the door. <laughs> They're right. There's, there's a bazillion of them. We could probably go on and on. But if you've been a Christian for very long and studied the Bible or been a part of Bible studies, you've probably heard that if you come across repeated words and phrases, that you should pay extra special attention. Something's being shared there that you probably should be aware of. Now, in the ESV, the word fool appears 40 times in the book of Proverbs. It's going to be used 11 times in the 12 verses that we're going to read this morning. Now, the ways of the fool are often contrasted with the ways of the wise. And wisdom is used 54 times in Proverbs. Now, this morning, like I mentioned, we're just going to focus on the first 12 verses. Not that the others are less important. But God impressed upon me during my prayer and study time that we need to focus on those, those 12 in our short time today. Now, if you join me, you can follow along up here or open a 26, Proverbs 26, and we'll read verses 1 through 12. Like snow in summer or rain in harvest, so honor is not fitting for a fool. Like a sparrow in its flitting, like a swallow in its flying, a curse that is causeless does not alight. A whip for the horse, a bridle for the donkey, and a rod for the back of fools. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Whoever sends a message by the hand of a fool cuts off his own feet and drinks violence. Like a lame man's legs, which hang useless, is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. Like one who binds the stone in a sling is one who gives honor to a fool. Like a thorn that goes up into the hand of a drunkard is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. Like an archer who wounds everyone is one who hires a passing fool or drunkard. Like a dog that returns to his vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. When you hear the term fool, a lot of different things might come to mind. If you're like me, you might think of a court jester whose job was to act silly and entertain others. If you're the right age, the word fool might also bring to mind someone like Mr. T from the TV show, The A-Team. Does anyone remember what he used to say? I pity the fool, that's right. Now, many of you may think of April Fool's Day and equate foolishness with being tricked. Still, others might think of someone who is dumb or gullible, maybe like the character on the Andy Griffith show, Barney Fife. I know he was a sweet character, it was a good show, but he had his antics. The term fool has a lot of connotations in our society. 
So in a little while, when we talk about how to handle fools, it's important to make sure that we define fool in the same way. The contrast between foolish people and wise people is one of the major themes in the book of Proverbs. So this morning, we're going to take a look at what the Bible has to say about what makes someone a fool and how to handle foolish people. Though Proverbs talks a lot about fools, it doesn't give us a simple or concise definition of what makes a fool, what makes a person a fool. However, we can begin to piece together a definition by looking at some of the characteristics that Proverbs lists as the hallmarks of foolish people. A fool does not seek wisdom. In fact, Proverbs 1.7 says that fools despise, scorn, loathe, or hate wisdom. Fools despise, scorn, or loathe, or hate wisdom. One of the trademarks of a wise person is that they listen to correction and they seek understanding. By contrast, the fool hates correction and makes no attempt to gain understanding. In a sense, they know it all. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. Proverbs 18.2 says, Whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse, and he who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. Do not reprove a scoffer, or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man, and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase in learning. That's Proverbs 9, 7 through 9. Now, this may not apply to you, and this might be a little bit gross to some, so go ahead and plug your ears if, if you're a little bit uh, squeamish. If you've had many dogs, I've had a couple of labs that were wonderful, but they were knuckleheads at the same time. And both of those dogs at different times had thrown up, okay? This is where you want to plug your ears. Both of those dogs would go back and eat what they just vomited. In Proverbs 26, 11, it says, like a dog that returns to his vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. A fool that repeats his folly is just like a dog that goes back to his vomit. One of the defining characteristics of a fool is sinful pride. Fools are convinced of their own righteousness and their own understanding because they don't want to gain any more. They know it all. They're less concerned with learning from others and more concerned with showing how much they know or just what they think they might know. They often don't even learn from their own mistakes. They blame others when it goes badly or wrong. The wise person, on the other hand, is wise because they know what they don't know, or at least they don't know what they don't know and they're willing to learn more. Have you ever had a conversation with someone who wanted to do something that you had experience with? I mean, genuine experience with. And I don't mean you're prideful about it, but God had blessed you with some experience this other person did not have. Naturally, you would think that you might be able to give them some guidance having walked the path yourself. I mean, you've been there, done that, you've got the t-shirt. As you talked with this person, it became apparent that they didn't know nearly as much as they thought they did. Maybe you tried to gently help them have realistic expectations or maybe gain a little better understanding. But they had no interest in hearing what you had to say. They were convinced. I mean, they had it figured out. This is the attitude or this attitude is the epitome of foolishness. A person had zero interest in seeking understanding. A fool is also uncontrolled. The foolish person does not keep a check on their desires, but instead gets full vent to them. The foolish person can be characterized by their anger, by their lust, possibly by their greed. They show no control over these things. In fact, Scripture says, a fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. That's Proverbs 29, 11. Or precious treasure and oil are in a wise man's dwelling, but a foolish man devours it. That's 20, Proverbs 21, 20. You see, foolish people do not keep a tight rein on their desires. They just full vent. They have no interest in restraining themselves because that would mean going without something they want. This is why the proverb says fools don't become rich. They don't save or invest because they are too eager to spend on whatever they want. The wise person knows that benign, by denying their desires now, they'll be better in the long run. The same is true with foolish person in regards to their anger. The fool quickly gives vent to their anger rather than trying to restrain it. This is, in part, why fools tend to be people who quickly fall off the handle. They only see what is right in front of them. They have learned by giving full vent to their anger, they get what they want, 
at least in that moment. They don't think about how expressing the anger might affect the relationship that they're engaged in or their situation in the long term. A fool is uncontrolled, not seeing much beyond their immediate situation. A fool does not submit to God. This is at the core foolishness. Again, a fool does not submit to God. This is at the core foolishness. One of the most famous passages in regard to this is Psalm 14.1. It says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable, thing, abominable deeds. There is none who does good. This is not merely saying that a person who claims not to believe in God as a fool, although it certainly is saying that. It is actually going deeper. Even a person who claims to believe in God can say in their hearts, there is no God. Such a person does not submit their lives to God's plan. They continue to go their own way. They may outwardly claim that God exists, and that may apply to some in this room today. Wear the right clothes, have the big Bible, have the smile. They're claiming that God exists, but inwardly, they're not living as though he exists. This attitude is the root foolishness, a desire to trust in our own judgment rather than in God's. Notice that the characteristics of a fool have to do with their character as a person and not with their intelligence, wealth, or position in life. There are people who are very smart who are also very foolish. Similarly, it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, both can be fools, both could also be wise. The person who's educated can be a fool just as easily as a person who is not. And the lowest man in the company can be just as foolish or just as wise as the person sitting in the corner office. We must not judge a person to be a fool on the basis solely of these external characteristics. A fool is a fool because of who they are on the inside. If you're like me, you take a look at some of these descriptions, you realize that these characteristics are sometimes descriptive of us. Every one of us acts foolish at times. However, foolishness is not the pattern of your life, but rather a temporary condition. I hope you're the type of person who listens to those who try to correct you, and you seek to make changes that are necessary. You desire to gain understanding. If you're that person, you are wise, even though sometimes you don't act like it. The truly foolish person isn't like that, though. They're convinced that those who offer correction are mean, dumb, or just wrong. They have no desire to change. They've got it all figured out because they have decided that how they live works for them and they should just continue doing that. They've perceived what is best for them regardless of what anybody else says. Now, as we start to look at how to deal with fools, we must keep in mind the two different types. The person who's occasionally foolish responds to correction and we can help them. But a response must be different for those who would prefer to wallow and their foolishness. I suspect as we've been talking about foolish people, some people you know may have come to mind. And we don't want to look or point at anybody maybe in this room. But dealing with foolish people is a part of life. So what should we do when we encounter foolish people? How should we treat them in order to avoid being dragged down into the consequences of their foolishness? Now, Proverbs actually gives quite a bit of instruction for how the wise person should deal with the foolish person. The first instruction in dealing with fools is to not sink to their level. Not sink to the level reminds me of a, a saying, never wrestle with a pig. You both end up dirty, and the pig just likes it. <laughs> and the same can be said for a fool. One of the strangest couple of verses in the Bible gives us this instruction. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. That's Proverbs 26, 4 through 5. Now, this is a strange passage because it sure seems like these two contradict one another. But the Bible doesn't contradict itself. And the author wouldn't have put these two verses together if they thought they were contradictory. So what do they mean? I think these verses point to the difficulty in dealing with foolish people. There's no simple answer. On one hand, we know that, we're, that what they are doing and saying is wrong. We want to help them. On the other hand, we know that fools tend to not listen to what other people have to say. So I think what the writer of these Proverbs is saying is that we need to show discernment on how, when, and possibly if 
we respond to a fool. You may be tempted when dealing with a person making foolish argument to argue back. With a person of understanding, this works. We exchange rational arguments and we come to a, the right answer. The problem with arguing with a foolish person is that they aren't interested in hearing what you have to say. If we continue arguing with a foolish person, we run the danger of becoming like them. We're resorting to foolish tactics in order to win. There's no winning when arguing with a fool. Now, James mentioned a couple weeks ago the strength finder. If you don't know what that is, basically it's, it's a personality assessment. Well, one of my strengths, it might even be the top strength, was competition. And for some of you, you've, you've got to witness that. And for others, um, I hope you never get to, but <laughs> full disclosure on that, because there are times I'm rather immature in my competitive nature, um, and I'm also a person who enjoys conflict, so a little story on that. When my bride and I were newly married, and I'm thankful she's still here after 24 years, I thought the goal during conflict was to win, okay? Now, the Lord, in his infinite wisdom, gave me a wonderful helpmate who doesn't quite enjoy conflict as much as me. Now, during some of our warmer discussions, she did a great job keeping a rein on her tongue. As you can imagine, during some of those exchanges, I thought I was winning because she was being silent. Really, by holding her tongue, she was playing the wise person, and I was the fool by running my mouth. Thankfully, after a, a speaker shared that in a conflict, if you're arguing to win, the relationship loses. I no longer need to win in those exchanges. I need to win in other things, but. So I understood that it's about resolving conflict and not about winning that exchange. Now remember the saying from earlier, never wrestle with a pig because you both get dirty and the pig likes it. The same thing is true when we find ourselves trying to answer the argument of a fool. Our strategy needs to be doing our best to show them the truth, but when it comes apparent they aren't willing to listen, it might just be to walk away. You don't get dirty that way. Many people simply love arguing, but when you argue with someone who won't listen, you're simply wasting your breath. You've surely, you've surely probably, or you've seen this on social media. Somebody posts something trying to incite the, the, their audience, and many people take the bait. And then the comments come. Nothing is accomplished by this other than people getting frustrated. We need to discern when a person is willing to listen and when they're not. We need to discern when a person is willing to listen or not. If the person isn't willing to listen, we shouldn't waste our time. Our words will have no effect. The second principle of dealing with fools is that we should tell or should, we should not give them responsibility. As we read earlier in Proverbs 26, 6, whoever sends a message by the hand of a fool cuts off his own feet and drinks violence. Or paraphrased in the New Living Translation, trusting a fool to convey a message is like cutting off one's feet or drinking poison. Or like an archer who wounds everyone is one who desires, excuse me, like an archer who wounds everyone is one who hires a passing fool or drunkard. That's in Proverbs 26.10. Now, the testimony of Proverbs is that hiring a fool to do a job or entrusting him responsibility is a foolish act in itself. The reason is pretty clear. There's a good chance that putting a fool in a position of responsibility will actually come back to hurt us. It doesn't seem like it would be all that hard to not put a fool in a leadership position. The problem is that sometimes a fool seems like they're the most qualified person for the job. A foolish person will often trumpet their own accomplishments in order to make everyone think that they're special. They might even be very talented and get results. The problem is that a foolish person thinks highly of themselves and has a low view of everyone else. A person who is unwilling to listen and learn will ultimately be a bad leader or employee. We can save ourselves a lot of trouble if we avoid putting fools in positions of power. Third is that we should not reward foolish behavior. Like one who binds the stone in a sling is one who gives honor to a fool. What happens if you try and tie a stone to a slingshot? Instead of the, the stone flying out towards a target, 
it very likely could end up coming back to you. We are told, not to honor, we are told that when we honor a fool, it will backfire. So instead of that rock traveling out, it could backfire and come back at you. The reason for this is that we are reinforcing foolish behavior and telling a person acting foolish to get what they want. They're being rewarded. Now, we understand this inherently with children, don't we? What do you do when your child throws a tantrum? When, you th- when they throw themselves on the floor, yell and scream, do you give them what they want? I doubt it. Now, parents understand in the midst of that situation, they need to see the big picture. They even know they want their child to stop because it's embarrassing. It will tell the child that they can always get what they want if they act that way. It may stop the tantrum now, but it will lead to more tantrum in the future. That strategy will backfire. That stone's going to come back and hit you again. Now, the same is true in dealing with a fool. We must refuse to reward foolish behavior. Sometimes this means refusing to give in to a grown-up tantrum, ignoring the threats made by a foolish person in order to help them see that such behavior is not the way to affect change. It's kind of like the saying that we teach people how to treat us. Sometimes it means refusing to take the bait, not getting mad at a person who's trying to get under your skin. As hard as it sounds, sometimes it means simply walking away from the person who's acting foolish. Dealing with fools is not only about what we should not do, there are also some things that we should do. First, we should listen to what they have to say. The danger in labeling a person a fool is that we could think that it gives us license to ignore anything they have to say. We have to be careful because it puts us in a place where we're better than them. So when we refuse to listen to others, we're being foolish ourselves. The wise thing to do with a foolish person is listen to what they have to say and evaluate whether or not there's any truth to it. We may not like it when we are being attacked or criticized by a foolish person, but we need to make sure that we ask ourselves whether or not what they're saying is true. If not, if so, we should quietly change or quickly change what needs to be changed. If not, we should dismiss what they have to say after we've listened to what they have to say. Now, this is the hypothetical. If there was ever a time when someone, even a church member, was to jump to all sorts of conclusions or accusations about something going on in the church with no real evidence, it'd be easy for the elders or an elder, elder board just to dismiss it because it's foolish. But we need to do first is to ask, is there any truth to the charges being leveled or being brought forth? Even though the person's response could be foolish, it'd be wise to examine the validity of what they're saying. Second, we should love them and try and point them to the gospel. At the core of foolish behavior is a failure to recognize God as the Lord of their lives. The remedy for foolish behavior is for people to see their need see their need to submit to the Lord and their need for a Savior in Jesus Christ. The fact of the matter is that at some point, all of us act foolishly. I'll say it again. At some point, all of us act foolishly. And we we should treat others the way that God treats us. God continues to love us even when we continue to sin against him. The temptation may be for us to look down on fools and to think of ourselves as superior to them. Of course, such an attitude is foolish. We should be respectful and loving, even if we're not shown that same love and respect in return. Note, though, that a loving person, loving a person is not the same thing as condoning their behavior. Sometimes the most loving thing we can do is help a fool see their foolishness. Often that means we need to let them experience the consequence of their behavior. We should do what we can to lead a person on the path that they should go, understanding that they may not listen to us. Let's listen to the advice given in Titus. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. It's Titus 3, 10 and 11. Now, there comes a point where we must stop arguing with a fool and leave them on their own. This should be our last resort, but sometimes it's necessary and it's okay to walk away. But even when we have left a fool 
to their own consequences, we can still be praying for that person, and we should be. Though we may not be able to change the heart of a fool, we serve a God that can. Now, in conclusion, we may like to think of fools as lovable characters who make us laugh and entertain us. But the biblical truth is, foolishness is not a laughing matter. Fools are on a self-destructive path, and the sad part is, they don't even know it. They think they got it figured out. They, can't only, they can not only hurt themselves, but they can hurt those around them if they aren't careful. If you remember, James shared a couple weeks ago about a recent survey or a survey he came across that resulted or showed that a large percentage of evangelical Christians not open their Bibles between Sundays. A church, if you're not opening your Bible during the week, according to Scripture, that's foolish behavior. Don't be foolish. The book of Proverbs gives us some practical advice regarding fools. First, it tells us that we should be careful to avoid becoming fools ourselves. We do that by opening our Bibles, reading it, and applying it. We should desire wisdom. Fools don't desire wisdom. We should desire wisdom. We should pay attention to correction from those around us. We should recognize our own limitations, know what we don't know, try and gain more understanding. But even if we avoid being foolish ourselves, we will still have to interact with those who are foolish. We should deal lovingly with such people, seeking to guide them out of their folly while being careful to avoid falling into the same traps they have. Foolishness is no joking matter. Foolish people can do a lot of damage to themselves, the church, their community, and those around them. The best way to avoid from becoming foolish is to anchor your life in wisdom. In other words, it is to read and apply the instructions of the Bible and put them into practice. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the instruction that it provides for our lives. Lord, I pray that we would take the necessary steps to not be fools. We would take the necessary steps to understand what makes a fool, understand what it takes to handle fools and to keep us from the consequences of their folly. Lord, I pray that we just submit our lives to you and to what you desire for us continue to grow in our knowledge and understanding of you, ultimately applying our lives to draw others to you. We just thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.